Welcome to Fan Counters. My name's Nick. And Elizabeth. And uh, Elizabeth, you are in so much hot water. I didn't do it. Nobody saw me do it. You can't prove a thing. Okay. So I come to her about a year ago and I say, hey, Elizabeth, let's do a podcast. Sure, Nick, whatever you say, I'll do it. I'll be there. Sometimes I struggle to get guests to commit or to come on the show because of scheduling or they're too popular for us or whatever the reason is. However, sitting to my right is somebody who went to high school with a movie actor and television actor who's been in films with, say, Minnie Driver, Vince Vaughn, Owen Wilson. Do you think she says anything until a year after we do this show? Nope. Elizabeth, you are fired. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry. I don't like I don't like to hit up my friends. And uh, today's guest and I went to high school together. And although I knew what she was doing, not until Crazy Rich Asians came out and it it spawned a discussion between you and I, did I say, "Okay, I will give you her name." <laughs> You didn't even contact her. I did. Well, that's because I didn't want it to look like I was using our friendship to do something. Oh, don't worry. I already put that in the email. I said, <laughs> hey, guess what? <laughs> so on today's show is Elizabeth's high school friend, Chudy Two. She's best known for her roles on Nashville and Days of Our Lives, but also has appeared on hit shows like Tucker's War, Two Broke Girls, Rizzoli and Isles, and one of my favorite movies, The Internship, which starred Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson. So, well, as you know, we tape in Milwaukee, which is also her hometown, and Judy is a pageant queen with a couple of notable accomplishments. The first was when she was the first non-Caucasian winner of America's Junior Miss Pageant. She did that while we were in high school. Oh. I know. She was also Miss Illinois in the 1994 Miss American Pageant, where she won the Talent Award for her classical piano performances. I have to tell you, this is one of the most piano talented people I had ever met in my life. I remember walking into our choir room and having her at the piano and it was absolutely stunning. We were, you know, 11, 12 years old mm -hmm. and she was phenomenal. We actually ended up writing our class song together or moreover, I thought we were going to write our class song <laughs> together. Um, but she was so way better and had such better ideas that she just wrote the entire thing. <laughs> but she really is an incredibly talented woman. Now, I am going to give you the heads up because I don't know what she's going to say. Um, in high school, there were like 11 or 12 people who had the name Elizabeth as their formal names. So okay. Apparently, in the late 60s, Elizabeth was an incredibly popular name. So we kind of doled out to become like Liz, Lisa, Betty, Betsy. Um, you all just picked a new name? Well, we kind of tried to do it. I moved from Beth to Elizabeth because I just didn't want to spend the rest of my life being <laughs> Beth T. So <laughs> I don't know whether or not Judy will slip into it or not, but if she does call me Beth, that is why, because shortly after, um, right in the middle of high school, we changed to different names because we couldn't all just be Beth in our last initial. It was just becoming very annoying because there really were a good nine or ten of us. I've never known you as Beth. I know. And so. there's, there's a whole group of, like, um, grade schoolers mm -hmm. who still call me Beth and it's somewhat startling yeah. to me because I've been Elizabeth for probably the last 30 or so years and so um, the funny story about that is as I came home and said to my parents good news we've all divvied up the names and I've become <laughs> Elizabeth and my mother looked at my father and said oh and I said what they're like well we really like the name Beth we just didn't think you should have a half name so we we named you Elizabeth, but we didn't actually think you were ever going to use it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so to their chagrin, I have been Elizabeth for the last 30 years. <laughs> oh, my gosh. With that, let's get to today's show. Here's Judy 2. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is Fan Counters with Nick and Elizabeth on the Podfix Network. There was this mob of people, and they're screaming my name. Crazy fans. Stop following me. Don't come around my house. If you do, the cops are going to be at yours. If I'm having dinner with my wife, don't sit down at my table. Don't follow me into the bathroom. Can I take a picture? We're gonna, oh, my God. I think this guy wants to fight me. Ended up being a fan. I'm the only one that's ever been on Sam Jackson and lived to tell about Well, it. guess what? I have a big surprise for you. That's why we call it Fan Counters. <laughs> I don't think you're going to laugh on the air very yeah. long. Hi, sweetheart. How are you? I am good. It's, whoa, it's great to reach 
uh, verbally across the mile? Yes. Well, I, I do have to tell you, I got yelled at by my partner, Nick. This oh. is Nick. Hi, Judy. Um, oh, hi. Because hi, we we went, okay, so you put out on your on your Facebook page about Crazy Rich Asians. And so yeah. I assumed, without looking any further into the feed, that you were in it. Oh, so I her. said. And, and hey, I would have loved to have been in it. Yes. Me. But I said to Nick, and Nick and I often go to the movies together on Tuesdays because our spouses and children are busy. And so we Uh went to go see it. And he kept going, I don't think she's in this. I don't think she's in this. (laughs) And then I said, because I kind of had offhandedly said, well, I know Chudy, too. And she's been in this, 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 and this. And he's like, what? I'm like scouring for guests. And you could have just picked up the phone and gotten one. And I was like, oh, my God. oh I'm sorry. Really Did funny. you want me to call? <laughs> Did you want me? Would you like to get? Um, Would you my like dad. To... Yeah, I'm like, oops. I'm like, I know where she is. I was, I didn't really, okay. I guess we'll, I guess we're calling her now. <laughs> so, so here we are. <laughs> so I love it. We're going to do it, it anyway. <laughs> yes, yes. Perfect. Perfect. Now, we have a history of welcoming guests who have come from somewhere outside of Hollywood who then move on to being successful in the entertainment industry. So, Trudy, what was it like for you growing up here, especially with Elizabeth, <laughs> and then moving out to Los Uh-oh. Angeles? Oh, my gosh. It's really funny, you know, how hindsight is twenty twenty. I think while I was living my life in Milwaukee, I just didn't know anything else, uh, anything other. And... In moving to L.A., I mean, and I had moved to uh, Chicago and also to Washington, D.C., uh, not in that order, but just lived in, in larger cities. Uh, gosh, Milwaukee, I have to tell you, uh, I, in juxtaposing Milwaukee to these other cities, it was just an awesome place to grow up in. Um, it, you know, like a, like a perfect combination of good solid values and just normal people <laughs> you know that 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 don't have a lot of masks that don't have a lot of pretense and then you know in the bigger cities especially someplace like LA while I absolutely love 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 LA you know there's there were some things to get used to uh uh yeah just like <laughs> you know how there are certain stereotypes of let's say flakiness um mm-hmm. It, you know, yeah, I think that's something that you just get used to. It's almost like it's in the water, and then you start becoming a little bit flaky, too. <laughs> <laughs> Don't drink the water, honey. You know, get it bottled. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly it. Well, and people would tease me, too. I, you know, friends from Milwaukee or Chicago, um, after living in, a, in L.A., probably, ooh, two years tops, I would get cold when, when it dips below 60 degrees. I'm like, oh, my God, it's freezing. I'm like, what's wrong with you? You know what I mean? You, you have just a new framework from which to see the world. So in our opening, we mentioned that you are, you've had some beauty pageant success. Did that come first, um, or were you pursuing an acting at the time as well? So, um, oh, yeah, pageants. And it's so funny because America's Junior Miss, I have to say this, <laughs> um, but... America's Junior Miss has never been considered a quote-unquote beauty pageant because that's not how they wanted to be seen as. It's it's more of a scholarship pageant. So right. they, you know how um, you probably have heard that the Miss America pageant has disbanded the um, swimsuit competition. Well, America's Junior Miss never had a swimsuit competition because they were already in the forefront of, you know, women empowerment and hey. It doesn't matter if you have a perfect figure or whatever. We want to know what are your grades, what's your community service, can you talk, blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, so I entered the whole you know, scholarship pageant, beauty pageant world with the express intent of let's you know, have a great time. And, and Elizabeth, you probably remember that at our high school, we had a nice long line of people who – just entered junior miss. You right. know what I mean? We did. And, and it's like, okay, who's, gonna, who's right. going to enter this year, you know? Yes. And um, great experience and, and whatnot. When I entered, uh, and actually those are the only two scholarship programs or pageants that I had ever been in. Um, I mean, officially been in. There are some that, like, you send in something, but then I never 
you know, there's so many different, you know, other little ones. Um, the Miss America pageant, I went there with the intent of financing further education. Okay. Um, and which was great because, you know, with my talent scholarships from the Miss America pageant, I was able to pay for acting classes and such. So, um, and, oh, which kid, like acting first or whatever. I, and, you know, Elizabeth, I, this is so funny. This feels like blast from the past. Um, Mrs. Oli, I think, taught a really cool, I don't know, it was like a women, female empowerment yeah. leadership class. Yes. And I remember in that class, yes, I was like, yes, I want to be one of the political leaders of the United States. I want to be, you know, one of the female presidents and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I've since um, changed my tone <laughs> once I realized how, <laughs> how contentious um, and difficult politics could be. You know, because I love the idea of, hey, let's make life better for everybody, regardless of race, color, or creed, you know. Um, and I thought politics was the way to do, do it. And actually, it was after college. In, in high school, I was involved, you remember, you know, musicals and whatnot, yep. and then in in college, in plays, in dance recitals, and in, in uh, those kinds of things, monologue shows, etc. And uh, it was soon after I grad- graduated, um, I was with a bunch of friends from college, and we were all talking about what do we want to do with our lives. And we were, it was January 1st, over cold pizza and beer. We were saying, what would you do with your life? And I had friends who would say, uh, they were going to law school. They said, oh, if, if money were no object and I could do anything, I would be a mediator uh, instead of a lawyer. But mediators don't make money. And everyone had, had ways that they were kind of um, throwing in the towel like, okay, well, what I really want to do isn't possible, so let me settle for something. And here we are in our early 20s. It, it, it felt so sad to me. I had a friend who wanted to be a ballet dancer. She said, yeah, but yeah, the, uh, that would be fine in Europe. But here in the U.S., the arts aren't respected. I'll become a psychologist. It, it was just so, yeah, it, it made me sad. So when it came to me, we're going in a circle, everyone. I went, you know, I really love performing. Yeah, I do. Why don't I just, what's stopping me? I love being on stage in front of the camera, let me jump in full force and do it professionally. Uh, and so that's when I was like, heck, I, that's when I fully committed. Before that, I had gone on some auditions and stuff, and it was just for quote unquote fun. Uh, okay. But yeah, it was kind of like, look, we, we, I have just this life. I don't want to follow the rules of what someone else says I think I should do. Okay, so I want to talk about this Miss Illinois thing, because you're okay. from Wisconsin, <laughs> so I want right? to find out, like, how how do you become Miss Illinois when you are, you know, I mean, do you have to live there a certain amount of time, or what's the story here? Yes, yes. So I went to Northwestern, and, um, and I was living in Chicago at the time, so I, I had actually um, entered the whole Miss Illinois pageant system after I graduated. Um, but yes, you're absolutely right. There is a residence requirement. I actually had to consider whether I wanted to move back to Wisconsin to enter the Miss Wisconsin pageant or stay in Illinois. And it actually, it was a hard decision because I love Milwaukee and my parents were still in, in Milwaukee at the time. Um, and of course, as you know, you know, tons of friends and some distant relatives and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I actually opted for Illinois just because I was already well situated there, you okay. know, and it is, it's kind of funny when you think about it. Um, I think running for public office is somewhat similar. The residency requirements, like how is it that, uh, for example, Hillary Rodham Clinton, I mean, of course, I don't know what her residency situation was at the time, but I think there's something like if you have a business or if you have a, uh, a home base somewhere for a certain amount of time, then, Boom, you're golden. So having a title like Miss Illinois seems kind of glamorous because you get to make appearances all year long and, you know, you're a recognizable figure. But from what I read when I was preparing for this interview, it wasn't quite 
the ride you expected. Tell me about that. Okay. I have to say, it was actually a nice preparation for what it's like to be an actor. <laughs> because, <laughs> of <course> the public, <laughs> the public sees the, the glitz, the glamour, the red carpets, the events, and the photos. Woohoo! And then it's behind the scenes where, whoa, you, you have to do some major grunt work. So what happens is these pageants, these scholarship uh, organizations are pretty awesome. They run so much on volunteer bases. You know, mm-hmm. uh, just people just come out of the woodwork to work for the actual pageant itself to put it together. And then community outreach and things like that. Now, um, occasionally some appearances would come through via one of the connections, one of the board members, maybe the executive director, whatever. But when it came down to, if I wanted something to happen consistently, I literally had to market myself. Uh, I I put together um, almost like a headshot and resume, but really more like a pamphlet for Miss Illinois. And I sent it out with cover letters to schools see if I could speak there. You know, it's just one of those things where I didn't realize, oh, this is like what I have to do. For some reason, I thought it was done for me, and all I had to do was show, show up. up yeah. <laughs> well, I kind of thought that, yeah. too. I was a yeah. little surprised. Yeah. Right? It is startling. Yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't work like that. And so, um, it, that, actually, that's a challenge when you have to do that kind of administrative work and then suddenly turn around and, okay, do your hair, makeup, all, all of that kind of stuff. And, and, and all of that is also self-done. It's not like I had 24-7 a makeup hairstylist on call. Yes, I need to go to an event. Do me now. You know, <laughs> that would have been great. It's, it's, it's just a one-woman machine. Wow. And uh, then, then show up at whatever ribbon cutting, whatever school. And I have to tell you, I, that's what I marketed towards more, where, where the schools, because um, I found that, like, living cut, cuttings or store openings. I mean, that's, uh, while that's perfectly nice, I didn't find them fulfilling. You know, right. I mean, like maybe you it would help talk to anybody, out really. a store. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I was like, does this make anyone happy? Does anyone really care? You know, mm-hmm. whereas with kids or, or speeches to um, maybe community service or something like that, you, it's, you have more one-on-one interaction People get to talk to you, and we get to ask questions back and forth. It's it's um, a much more enjoyable ride, so to speak. What are some of those memories from the Miss America pageant that are something that you'll remember forever? You know, I I have all of these cute little vignettes in my head. Uh, I think it's all about relationships. So for me, I remember like some of the jokes that we would play late at night or. Uh, the, it, it's so funny. My glimpses and my strongest memories are, oh, I remember throwing fortune cookies and people catching them from the, because that was my shtick. You know, uh, <laughs> there's a boardwalk parade where they call, hey, show us your shoes. I forget exactly, but I think it's like the shoe parade and every state uh, representative gets to wear some fat pair of fabulous, fabulous shoes and show them to the, to the, <laughs> to the, audiences and the crowd and um part of my thing was you know just kind of ethnic diversity make it just let's jazz things up a little bit so what i did was i tossed out um fortune cookies and inside said you know like uh something very pageanty but lovely like um, you know peace and blessings from miss america okay. I'm, sorry, <laughs> miss, miss, america. Miss, sorry, miss illinois miss illinois you yeah. know what i mean um so, and that was just a lot of fun it, It's one of those things, too, because it was such a tradition. People got really psyched up about that. And then also about the pageant. I have to admit, I did not grow up thinking, you know, from a little uh, wee baby girl going, someday I want to wear that crown. You know what I mean? It was so sometimes I would be just agog, like, wow, people, this is this is a culture. People really love it. They have a good time. You know, it was like getting a peek into a world that I wasn't familiar with. Um, and then, I, I seriously, some of the girls will, or now women, we would just have late night, post midnight, you know, talks about life, guys, what are we going to do with life? I mean, it's, it's, it was like a big sorority party. Um, 
So those are my fondest memories of that whole thing. It's it's because it was a bunch of women, young women, who all are are striving for scholarship uh, mm -hmm. assistance, trying to better themselves, also just really wanting to see, hey, can can we do something that matters in the world? Now the pageant's not just one night. It sounds like this was. Uh, oh, like no. a week long thing, it was or how three long was weeks. it? No way. Three weeks of rehearsals, of interviews, and honestly, we got tops five hours of sleep a night. Usually four to five hours, and then it it it's actually it is more grueling than any shoot, any film, television shoot, whatever I have been on. Wow. Because you are constantly on. We had media outlets from around the country and some even internationally for interviews they would pull us out of rehearsals or out of whatever social event was going on and it was a constant juggle where you're having to go from okay i'm learning my two steps for on stage later to okay now i'm talking to the boston globe and it it's it's so bizarre to constantly you know make that shift and also try to look good, sound good, be somewhat coherent when you've had only four hours of sleep. No <laughs> kidding. No wonder sometimes someone, some people might think, oh, wow, she sounds really ditzy. Yeah, she had no sleep. <laughs> <laughs> like, who's, she right? hasn't slept who's in days, people. Good? All right, let's move on to <laughs> acting. So, okay. um, so actually, some of the very first things I saw, and it was one of those things that you see and then you go, was that Judy? Did I not see you on some sort of, was it Suzuki piano? Some piano, yes. some piano thing. And I, yes. I remember thinking in the back of my head, because you were supposed to have shown them how well you learned this system. And I was thinking in the back of my head, you understand that that woman is a phenomenal piano player in high school, right? I think she came out of the womb playing the piano. So I'm not really sure I'm going to buy your piano playing system because I know she already knows how to play piano. And I remember thinking... Gosh, we weren't that we weren't that old. I mean, that was relatively close to you coming out, was it not? Coming out to LA? It, yes, it, bingo. That was actually one of the first gigs that I booked. I love that you remember that. And I was so excited because Herbie Hancock also did that was an infomercial. Yes, it was. And it was like a thirty minute long thing about uh, it was I think it was called piano discovery and how to play the piano and um, I was just so excited. I did not get to meet Herbie Hancock, but the idea that we were technically in the same, in the same project, show. Yeah. Like, oh, wow, this is really cool. And here, and here's something. It it's really cool how you know. And Nick, I know you can attest to this as well. How how our industry works. Um, they had sent out. They want. It was actually open ethnicity. They did want a female. Um, had to be able to play the piano well and that she would be some sort of uh, uh, expert in piano or, or something, you know, mm -hmm. and, and obviously like what you said, uh, Elizabeth, you know, versatile in, in, uh, in being able to play the piano. And so uh, the age range was 40 and up, but my agent sent me out anyway because they knew I could play the piano really well. Yes. So they changed it to be okay for my age at the time. Oh, you know, nice. Mid twenties. Isn't that great? That's so it's, cool. It's weird because um, sometimes Hollywood works that way, where uh, casting can change if you know they're ne they're able to change their needs or the project. You know what I mean? Um, otherwise, uh, sometimes you're out of luck. But but this was when I was in luck. <laughs> well, and then I also walked through the room one day and caught you on Moesha. Oh my gosh. Yes. And I oh, had to rewind God. it or because I and I was like, I swear to God, that's Judy. And I had to rewind and I had to rewind and then I had to try to pause it during the credits because I'm like, I swear to God, that is Judy too. <laughs> and and you know, it was kind of weird because although we assumed you were going to be an actress, we just didn't, you know, <laughs> nobody actually believes any of us are gonna do what we say we're gonna do. <laughs> so Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's so oh, and you, it's, it's funny because yeah, gosh, and uh, Moesha, Moesha was a really great project. Um, I loved the director, um, Henry Chan, and I've worked with him um, several times. That's something you know, just like in in life, uh, you get to work with your friends. Wow, Elizabeth, you and Nick, this is a perfect example. 
you know, Nick, when you had, or you wanted to look for a, another person to co-host and, and collaborate with you on this, right? you know, I'm sure there could have been tens of thousands of people slash women who, um, even in the Milwaukee area, I can do that. I'd love to do that. But you, you go to someone you like, you know, you trust. So absolutely. Boom. Yep. Yeah. You know, you guys make magic. And, and sometimes people ask me in, um, regarding my career, it's like, Oh, why did you go this path? And why do you go this path? Sometimes you basically we're like fish in life. We mm-hmm. swim where we can, you know, sure. I might want to be in another pond, but I'm right here. And these are the fish I'm meeting with. So these are the fish I'll collaborate with. Tell us a little bit about the, you know, you moving to LA and getting a career started. That's not an easy thing. What made you consistently start booking roles? Like at what point, you know, what was there some magic that you found that ended up working for you? You are asking the quintessential question, I think, that all actors, regardless of what stage they are at in life or in their career, they will ask. I even remember Tom Hanks. Um, he was, after he had won back to back Academy Awards, um, I forget what, it was uh, Forrest Gump and Philadelphia, I think. Yes, I, don't yes. quote me because I'm, I'm pretty a little sure bit you're foggy. Right. Yeah. And then he was uh, on a talk show, and they said, what next? And he said, well, I'm now looking for another job, so if anyone wants to hire me, <laughs> because that's what our life is like. Right. It is constant searching. So um, th- there's no, I don't think there is a magic pill, because I'm still looking for that magic pill, and if you have it, I'll <laughs> buy it off you. Um, <laughs> but, but what the best thing, you know, attitude, constantly working towards it, like never stopping. That doesn't mean don't rest, but not to get lazy or lackadaisical and sit back on your haunches and be like, okay, yeah, I know people know who I am. They'll come to me. No, nope. <laughs> like you need to keep on in the forefront of people's minds, which is why you'll see actors, actresses, writers, producers, directors, uh, constantly in, well, I don't need to tell you this, Nick, sorry. <laughs> I'll just talk <laughs> as an actor. I'm, I'm like, hello, Nick. Um, uh, just constantly, like, let's say on social media or whatever, some people feel it's rather self-promoting, but it's promoting because we want to work. Right. It's, it's not, oh, look at me, I'm such a great person. It's like, no, let me help you remember me. Because to be perfectly honest, that when I have cast things or referred people to other projects, it's, oh, wow, I just saw so-and-so. She did a Facebook post. She'd be perfect for this. It's, it's crazy how that happens. You know what I mean? Um, so one of, one of the magic pieces, I would say, is attitude. And two is always having things in the pipeline. Always, always, always. Either writing slash producing your own things, um, going to networking events and making sure to collaborate with others, offering services, offering to help, whatever. Uh, it helps push your career forward forward in ways you never even realized. And so that way you keep the energy going. Um, apart from that, just elbow grease. That's it. So um, I want to ask this question, and I get to ask all of the sensitive questions since I have the African-American and the Hispanic child. Um, and you're the woman. And I am the woman, so I do. And, and you're the woman. And I am the woman here, so I get to ask everybody all of the <laughs> pertinent and social questions. <laughs> So being Asian American, do you find that your looks help or hinder you getting roles? Okay. So it's so funny I, that you um, asked that question because I'm going to paraphrase the question okay. in the sense that give it, you know, has, uh, because how it's phrased, it sounds like, you know, because of who I am, the onus is on, oh, being Asian could suck or not suck, could help or not help. Okay. As opposed to the project itself, it's like, okay, what are the projects out there and what are they open to? Um, And so I would say that, yes, there have been times, especially at the beginning, where where things could be challenging. And and I don't think the challenges ever stop, regardless of who you are, you know, what, again, what your race, background, sexual orientation. Um, when I first started, there were definitely less 
roles for people of color. And that was a, that, that was something to just constantly push uh, against or try to sweep away, trying to lobby against um, or, or open people's eyes. Luckily, I had um, and have had um, uh, managers, agents, people on my team that really believe in me. So like, for example, the piano discovery, they put me for some, put me up for something that technically I wasn't right for, but they're like, let's, let's try it. Let's try to break down these doors and, you know, um, see if they're open to it. Uh, funny enough in my career, I have booked more things that were for either ethnically ambiguous or they wouldn't, they'd just be open. Okay. They, they wouldn't specify what race. Funny enough for me, I, I've come across, because I am, you know, a mix of Chinese, Filipino, Spanish. Um, in Hollywood, a lot of times I would get the whole, you're not Asian enough. Oh. Because what, oh, yes, I can't even tell you. We want someone who's really Chinese. And I would want to say, do you realize in this room of 25 Asian women, I am the only Chinese person here? Yes, I'm half Chinese, but, but the other half makes me have, you know, slightly more almondy eyes, darker skin, so, you know, right. Different longer features. highlights yeah. in here. Yeah, those things that they're not expecting. Now, I used to be really angry about, oh, why does Hollywood try to reinforce stereotypes? But since I've um, grown as a writer slash producer, I also realize in the visual medium that we have, we have a short time. We are not showing 600 pages of a novel and a person's life. We might have only 23 minutes on a sitcom, so uh, uh, because 23 minutes because we have to allow for yeah, whatever, commercials, uh, yeah. commercials. So people have got to see right away and like kind of get you. They don't. Want, they're not going to go. Hmm. I wonder what her backstory is. What's your ethnic background? You don't want a viewer's mind to go down that rabbit hole. You want them to be like, ah ha ha, that's such a funny joke. Not right. hmm. You know, like that, that kind of thing to, to muddy the message. So I get it. I get why it has happened before. Um, and so I'm not as angry about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. Now, Trudy, one of your first film roles was in the Sally Field-directed film Beautiful. And actually, that film has come up on this show before. It was a f movie that starred Minnie Driver and featured a past guest of ours, dancer and choreographer Kristen McQuaid. She played Miss Pennsylvania. You played Miss Hawaii. Uh, do you have any memorable moments working with Sally Field or Minnie Driver that you can share? Absolutely. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sally Field is an incredible force of nature and um, so accomplished and award-winning and whatnot. It, it was intimidating at times to be sure. in her presence. Um, I have two memories that I love. Um, one time we were waiting for, uh, a, for rehearsal and we were waiting for Paula Abdul, who was, I think, let's just say she was super late. I don't remember how many hours late, but she was late. Oh my God. So we, we turned it into a powwow of just girlfriends, including Sally Field and Minnie Driver, mind you, just talking about life and sharing experiences. So we literally got to pepper Sally Field and Minnie Driver with, with questions, what's it like, you know, whatever, talk to us, uh, uh, inspire us, wow. drop the knowledge, you know. So um, Sally Field confessed that even at her level, you know, she, same thing, auditioning for things and whatnot. And her philosophy has been, you know, if she can't get some amazing, amazing project, she hopes that one of her dear friends can. And that's actually what happened on a particular project that she was up for. She was up for a lead in a movie. She found out one of her good friends got it. And she called up that good friend and said, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Oh, no. That being said, I am so happy for you. <laughs> I, I love you to pieces. You know, it's like that first part, she's just being human. It's like, yeah, yeah. guess what? I really wanted that role. Like, it was going to be so awesome. But that being said, I'm so happy that you got it. Because I, you know, I love you and I support you and whatever. It's, it's, you know, it can be a, a pretty challenging business when things like that happen. <laughs> and it was great to hear that from Sally Field. The other one was, so I uh, in Miss 
uh, in um, the movie as Miss Hawaii. I'm one of the top finalists and all that kind of stuff. And mm-hmm. I played the piano and I was playing a really difficult piano piece. A lot of people don't realize that once you play like a huge etude or something that requires a lot of muscular effort uh, and dexterity, it's like running a marathon. So after I play it once, I can't just turn around, cut, reset, and action. <laughs> can't do it. I need to rest, okay? <laughs> Hello. It's like you don't go, oh, you're done with ma- ma- that marathon. Great. Turn around and do another one. It's, it's just not yeah, yeah, physically possible. So what started happening was, okay, first take, awesome. But, ooh, you know, some things happen with the sound, with the light, uh, lights, whatever. Um, take two. Okay, I started playing, but it didn't sound so good. I was making some mistakes. My fingers were cramping up. Cut, reset, you know, take three and action. Oh, my gosh, you guys. <laughs> my fingers were so cramped. I was, it, it sounded like a kindergartner was trying to play this <laughs> etude. It was ridiculous. And so Sally jumps in. She's like, cut, cut, cut. It's like, shooty, what's going on? Oh, by the way, mind you, this was in a theater, like a gigantic theater. It was huge. And there, there are hundreds of extras. So the whole idea of cutting in the middle, like, we're wasting money. Why is Shooty screwing up? You know what I mean? There was this, this air of, of that. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't mean to screw up. And Sally was like, what, what's happening? What, what can I do? What can I help you with? And I said, lactic acid is so built up in my arms. Can we find a PA to help me, like, massage my arms? Because... I can't play now. And she said, oh, okay. So Sally Field starts to give me a forearm massage. Wow. And I was like, I'm like, oh, my God. Can someone take a picture of this? This is amazing. <laughs> I, and <laughs> but that she had such the attitude of she will do whatever it takes to, to help her team create a great story, do a go- good job telling this, you know, journey or whatever. I was so inspired by that by that philosophy, by her whole attitude. And it bled throughout the whole production. So, um, and unfortunately, I don't have a photo of that. I wish I did. Okay. <laughs> I, have a, I do have a photo with Sally Field, just not massaging my arms. Wow. <laughs> I know. So you've had the opportunity to work with some of Hollywood superstars like Rob Lowe, Woody Harrelson, Robin Wright. Have you ever been starstruck? Okay. That's funny. Um, I wouldn't call it starstruck. I mean, I am very, very inspired by people's work, and I will tell them, you know, like, oh, my gosh, you were amazing in this, uh, the heart that you brought, et cetera. So, uh, but instead of starstruck, what I would say is I kind of get eyeball struck, like eyes struck. Rob Lowe has some of the bluest eyes I've ever seen, and when I first met him, that like, it didn't matter if it was Rob Lowe. It could be Joe Schmo. And I'd be like, oh, my gosh, those are real eyes. I feel <laughs> hypnotized. I cannot talk. You know what I mean? They are quite <laughs> lovely on Rob Lowe. Right? It's like, wow. Yes. You know, and I have to admit, it happened again um, when I first met the, the young actor playing uh, my son on a project that I just, um, that I just shot, and it aired, uh, Alex and Me, where I play Anne Wills, the mom of, of uh, a young soccer player and her brother, my mm-hmm. son, um, has the most amazing, like glowing green hazel eyes that I just wanted to go, are you an alien from another <laughs> planet? <laughs> you know, I'm like, how did you get those eyes? Can I order them? You know, <laughs> it's just, it's, it's, I, that's what will kind of starstruck me is eyeballs. So our show is called Fan Counters. So I actually want to know if you've had any strange or weird encounters with any of your fans. You know, um, I've never had weird ones. Uh, I, knock on wood. Watch. Now they'll just come out of the woodwork. <laughs> <laughs> your your Twitter feed's like, going to no, blow I up. One. I have a new story. <laughs> but it, what's kind of cool is cool and also... Uh, uh, shocking sometimes is that people, when I least expect it, I might not have any makeup on. I could be having a bad day, actually. And uh, someone could, co- could come up to me and be like, wait, I know you. you know. And then you realize, oh, my gosh, I should probably be 
in a better mood right now, right? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm kind of frowning and scowling and muttering under my breath. Um, but uh, there was one time that really took me by surprise. It's in the middle of the Christmas season. Um, I'm in the Caesars Palace bathroom. And it's just really crowded and sweaty and people are impatient. And I'm washing my hands trying to get the heck out of there. And this woman stops and she goes, oh, I know you. I'm like, you do? Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, uh, did we go to school together? How do you, how do you know me? She goes, I love you. I'm like, That's great. I <laughs> think I like you too, I hope. You know, I mean, it's so funny what people say. And she goes, oh my gosh, when you put your partner away, and she started to talk, talk about my role as Detective Lynn in Desire, she's like, you were very good. I'm like, oh, thank you. So then that suddenly I, I established trust. I'm like, oh, you thought I was great. Well, then I like you. <laughs> <laughs> we, we get a lot of bathroom you. encounters. Yes. Lots of people say <laughs> things like, like, why do people talk to me in the bathroom? We get that a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yes, bathroom. What is, it's because, you know, I'm sorry, but when you're in the bathroom, you're, you really let your guard down. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. I am now kind of like just <laughs> no... Yeah, I have no place no to go here. I'm whatsoever. trapped, and you're going to talk to me. Here we go. <laughs> Look, I, guess, I, I met exactly. I met Mr. Belding, say by the bell, I know. in the bathroom. But I waited till we were outside the bathroom, and a few minutes later to talk to him. Yes, so because I'm just going to tell you, we've I, had a couple men who have complained at the urinal that yeah. someone wants to talk to them while they're like, not not now, I wasn't please. Be that guy. <laughs> yes, yes, this is rather compromising. You know, why, wait, why are you doing this? Yes, it's very true. Um, and then another time I was actually pumping gas in Hawaii. And and I was on a vacation and um, actually going to a film festival. And while I'm pumping gas, someone just, a, a wonderful gentleman, a gentleman goes, you know, he, he actually didn't even ask me if it was me. He goes, by the way, ma'am, I saw your movie. And I, but again, I am not, you, you pump gas. I, if anything, I might expect someone to ask me for money, not, you know what I mean? Not to have a substantive conversation. He started telling me how um, Pretty Rosebud, uh, the movie I, I wrote and starred in, that, that it inspired him. He had a sister who went through something similar. I, and I was, and then I started to bawl while pumping gas because I was so touched by what he was telling me. So it was kind of funny. I think it, it made it, uh, and then I gave him a hug. I was like, thank you, because that's why I do this. That's why I think a lot of actors do what they do is, is to inspire people and help people realize they're not alone, you know? Now, you did have a role in one of my favorite films, The Internship. It starred Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson. Now, I've got to know, what was that experience like working with, like, two mega stars like that? Okay, uh, very, very interesting, because I didn't know what to expect. Um, so Owen Wilson, before I even got onto the set, I mean, literally, I'm walking up to set, and he had to be, he happened to be walking um, off for a bit, and he said, oh, uh, you must be playing Yo-Yo's mom. I'm Owen. I'm, I'm, and he gives me a hug and, a, you know, like a welcome kiss on the cheek, and I'm thinking, yeah, no, I, I do know who you are. <laughs> I'm, I'm well aware with who you are. <laughs> and he was just so welcoming and disarming. Um, I, I, he has a, a sense, a wonderful grounded sense, like that, that you could be friends and, you know, he's super duper cool. Like I very, very down to earth piece. Now, Vince Vaughn was a pleasure to work with. Um, the thing is, I didn't get to see as much of his, you know, maybe his guard down or his, 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 uh, relaxed personality because he was also a writer and producer on the show. Um, and of uh, being one myself, I understand why he was constantly like, he was constantly looking at things. He was always on point. So even if he saw something like a wardrobe malfunction or, or something that was not um, consistent, he'd be like, wait, no, 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 we need to change this. He was constantly working and you could tell he was just on all cylinders. So I really didn't get to talk with him personally one-on-one but in working with him you know quintessential pro and and very very funny 
it's really interesting for me to hear about the Owen Wilson encounter because, like, for me, even in the movie Wonder, the internship, all of them, he's kind of the same character. Uh, so it does seem from that story that he's sort of the same easygoing personality that he portrays on the screen. That's just Owen Wilson on screen, yeah. off screen, same guy. That's cool. Yeah, which isn't it really cool? Yeah. And, um, believe it or not, I think that that is also a talent. People who aren't actors or are not familiar with being on a set and stuff, um, they might think, what's the big deal? But if you just notice, even animals, you put a camera on them, they change. They don't do the same thing, whatever. There's, there's almost a disconnect because there's the energy of now we are do documenting who you are, what you say, what you do. So it's actually a huge talent. James Gandolfini actually said it when he was uh, uh, um, accepting one of his awards. He said, people don't realize it, but playing yourself is one of the most difficult and naked and vulnerable things that you can do as an actor. Because uh, if you're, uh, we're so used to putting masks up in the first place um, on a daily basis. You know what I mean? Yep. So to, to unmask yourself... Um, it's it's a talent, and I, I think it's awesome that he does it because he's yeah he's he's one of those people you just want to hang out with. Looking your over <laughs> your IMDb resume, there are gaps between projects. Did you have to supplement your income to take non-acting jobs, and if so, what were you doing? It's very interesting about IMDb because those gaps they look like gaps. Um, it's so so interesting because oftentimes when things are in the pipeline, you know in uh, in the producer's hands, in the studio's hands, they release the project either when it's ready, when they feel it's timely, and however it fits in with the lineup of their other projects. Mm. Okay. And so there are times where it looks like there may have been a gap. And actually, those are some of my busiest times because I was actually shooting things that came out later. Wow. So it's a really weird thing. You're like, oh, well, this looks like I didn't do anything. I love, I mean, like for that one, you know, like a, a two period time, uh, time frame. Um, I also find IMDb deceiving because it doesn't put out, obviously, because it's internet movie database, it doesn't have commercials. It doesn't have theater. It so doesn't true. have experimental projects. Up until recently, and you, you, you uh, know this well, Nick, having your own webisodes, um, things like webisodes and, you know, new alternative forms of media, like they weren't exactly sure how do we do this? How do we document this? Do we put it on the IMDb? You know what I mean? So um, I, I've, actually, I've actually, knock on wood, wow, I've actually been very blessed to be working consistently. Um, I, there was a period of time when I had my own business, like a health and beauty um, selling business, but I intentionally stepped away from that because I was like, you know, I don't have time for that because, you know, acting, I, in order to keep the pipeline going in my acting career, which is the most important thing to me, you know, not, not anything on the side, I want to make sure to dedicate all of my energy there. And it was just, you know, too busy. Uh, I can say, though, at the beginning of my career, um, you know, you just want to pay the bills. So I have done any, everything from like teaching piano lessons, catering. I even taught some compu quote unquote taught computers, which is actually pathetic if you think about it, because I'm not very computer savvy. It's just that there are people who are so much less computer savvy than me. So I could actually okay, yeah. teach like, <laughs> I'm like, and this is how you turn on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Can Elizabeth get a yes. lesson from you, please? Yeah, because I'm not authorized to do anything on our social media but Facebook. <laughs> because I don't understand Twitter and I don't understand. What's the other thing we have? Instagram. Yeah, I don't even know what that means. So, uh, yeah, I'm not authorized to touch anything that has to do with any of our social media. Step away from yes. the social media. Uh -huh. Step away from Instagram, Elizabeth. Yeah. I'm allowed to share things on the Facebook page if he pushes a share button. Otherwise, I have to call him and have him share it on my page. That's <laughs> Not authorized to do any of that. Yes. Oh, my gosh. 
for a lot of years, and you mentioned it before, you were working and writing on a writing a script called Pretty Rosebud, a film that you also yeah. starred in and directed by your husband Oscar. So tell us a little bit about that journey. I have a journey myself trying to get a film made for the last six years. So I can't wait to hear. How did you talk talk to me about getting this film made? What was it like turning over that project once it finally got a green light over to your husband to bring to life? Oh, yes. Um, It's so interesting. Okay, I I have to digress a little bit. Say on the same topic. I love that you asked it in that way because at some point, Q&As that we had for, for the film, people would actually ask Oscar, said, so Oscar, it must have been a pleasure um, working with your wife on this. So what made you to de- decide to cast her in this film? <laughs> and I, oh my gosh, you have no idea. I mean, if you want to get me mad. <laughs> <laughs> Steal my thunder like, and give it to my I'm husband. Like, That'll tick me off. <laughs> yes, right? It's like, no, 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 no. On what are you're making some major assumptions? And I right away I took it as a gender thing. Like, oh, so you think that he's the driving force behind all of this? I'm like, no, 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 no. And but that's not to discredit Oscar whatsoever, because I will have to say, it was with his constant prodding, encouragement, inspiration that I, I decided to go for it. You know that whole thing of where. Uh, I think oh, Gerta, some some philosopher who escapes me right now. I feel like it's Gerta who said, you know, the moment you commit, the the universe will conspire to help you achieve your goal. Something like that. That was terribly paraphrased, but the same message. I felt like that happened, but it was Oscar who kind of put the fire beneath my butt. So here's what he said to me. I specifically remember I had been sitting on this script and I would constantly revise it like, oh. I could sharpen this character, uh, this little plot point. Oh, wait a minute, let's add this one. Oh no, let's 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 switch these scenes around. You know that kind of thing. Just constantly fussing. And at one point, Oscar said, "You know, if you don't get this movie made, you won't play the main role. You'll play the mom role." Ooh. And I was like, "Oh Ouch. my gosh, that's what? wonderful!" Oh, that right away. Honestly, that was like he shot lightning in my veins. I was like, "Screw that." <laughs> I'm making this. <laughs> There's no friggin' way anyone else is playing, you know, the role that I wrote for myself. And it, he was right because, you know, if past a certain age, it wouldn't be the same story and I would have to completely change things and whatever. Um, it was it was a wonderful, exhilarating, terrifying, at times frustrating process. Um, one of the stories I I love to I I mean there's so many stories in the in the production process of this but in pre-production I remember we're looking for uh it was me Oscar and another woman that I had worked with on a documentary Rebecca who who's an amazing producer um we were trying to find locations and I needed to find a Catholic church now I'm sorry other churches will not suffice for a Catholic church I'm one of these people, like Oscar, my husband laughs, because in, in any film, television show, I'll look at something and let's say it's something that's supposed to be Catholic. I'm like, I'm like hell no, that's not a Catholic church. <laughs> you know, like I, I can tell, you know, right. and I'm like, oh gosh, look, that priest, he doesn't know how to make the sign of the cross. What the heck is that? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm like Catholic expert. Oscar's like, okay, slow your roll. You're a little too intense about the Catholic <laughs> stuff, you know? <laughs> but I, so I was, I was up in arms because I could not find a church. Okay, we shot in L.A. So you can imagine that everyone is pretty Hollywood and, and entertainment business savvy. I had churches wanting to charge half our budget for a day. Oh, my gosh. I was like, and I was in tears. I'm like, oh, my gosh, we can't, how, we, how can we not shoot any of the church scenes? Those are, they're so important. You know, like, oh, my gosh. And, and so I, I started, there, there's a, there were some uh, locations where they, they changed, the, you know, like, like kind of quasi made up sets, like uh, churches that can supposedly be made into other things and um, uh, 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 other things, other like auditoriums or whatever. And I just remember, oh my gosh, and then we have to pay for pews. No, this is not going to work. Like I was going crazy 
there, there were, I couldn't find anything. And um, I think after visiting and meeting with 65, over 65 churches, wow. I finally found one that was willing to work with us. Oh, like, my goodness. And it was, it was to the last, I, w- I was like, I, I'm not sleeping until I find a church because we are shooting in a couple of days. Like I was freaking out, you know, and, um, Trudy, so, they, pr- Trudy, they yeah. probably looked at you like you were the remodeling budget sent from God. <laughs> like, look, this <laughs> movie really wants to true. film here. Here comes the new roof, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's what they were thinking. They're like, hallelujah. <laughs> Our prayers have been answered. And I'm saying my prayers have been answered. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, you know, and, and just even the church thing, I, I have to say, so we, we, what we did was we found a church who was willing, like not, not do the whole day, uh, but like maybe we could do things in half day increments so that um, they could still have their masses and stuff like that. So that was one of the reasons why they were willing to work with us. And it was so funny. The mass was at five o'clock, um, the afternoon mass, and we were shooting literally up until 4.58. <laughs> and we were like, okay, and cut everyone out. And we're like grabbing things. I, and it didn't matter who you were. If you're an extra, I, I picked up, you know, booms and, and, and sandbags. I'm like, let's get the heck out of here. They're having mass. And people are walking in. And it was the cutest thing because um, one of the women, um, uh, they had confession also at, in the, uh, at that mass, you know, before, before yeah. the mass, before entering the mass. And, um, one of the parishioners, an older woman, looked at our actor who was playing our priest, Father Antonio, in the film. And she said to me, is, is that priest hearing confessions? Because if so, I want to go confess. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, not today, ma'am. <laughs> yes, no, not today. No, he's not going to be hearing confessions. <laughs> so funny. Oh, that's cute. Oh. So I haven't seen Rosebud. And I tried, though. I looked on Netflix. It's not there because I was going to watch oh, it. And, but, and let me tell you why it's not on Netflix. Because Netflix, um, especially for, I would say, you know, things that aren't, let's say, released by a, a studio, or something, studio like or something like that, the money that we will get in return is d- very minimal. I've it's, heard that. It's, what, yeah. It's, it's like that is the last. It's like for net Netflix, it's almost to the point. I mean, I wish they supported more of the you know unknown production companies, you know, lesser known um, and independent types of projects. More monetarily, I'm not saying they're not supportive at all, but like monetarily would be nice because um, yeah, I, our distributors have has have specifically said we're not going to Netflix for a while because. <laughs> They don't pay money. Hmm. Um, it's, it's like giving it away for free. So tell and us where we I can find ne- it. I just say that again. So tell us where we can find it. Oh yes, you can find it on Amazon Prime, uh, iTunes, on Google Play, and on Hulu. And okay. actually, there are some other platforms, but I think those other platforms might be European or African, which is crazy. I, Pretty Rosebud is all over the world. Like it's it's. I have gotten some friend requests from from the most random of places. I'm like, that's awesome, I think. You know? <laughs> it is. I, and, and then I'll realize, oh, that's right. We have a distribution with um, Mozambique. Something, you know what I mean? Like something very, something very remote. So, um, yeah, it, I, I'm happy that it's, it's, it's reaching all over the world. So Rosebud's famously known as the name of a sled in Citizen Kane. Did that have yeah. anything to do with where you named yours Pretty Rosebud? Not, nope, not Nothing. whatsoever. In fact, um, something that predated Citizen Kane, uh, I actually did research for this. Uh, I'm sure. Predated Citizen Kane um, uh, by decades was a nursery rhyme. It's like a, a children's nursery rhyme uh, called Pretty Rosebud. So, so the name of the film is not just Rosebud, it's Pretty Rosebud. Mm-hmm. And in the film, uh, we actually end up singing it, uh, me and the actress playing my mom, um, because that is actually a song that my grandmother sang 
to my mom and that my mom sings to, or sang to me and my siblings and that my mom and I and my siblings, we sing to the grandchildren. You know what I mean? My nieces and nephews. According to our research, Oscar hasn't directed a credited project before Pretty Rosebud. Did, was that a concern for either of you? So it was not a concern because the parts where he might not have had as much experience, we made sure that we had a team, you know, that, that did have experience, you know, okay. uh, to, to fill in the gaps or whatever. But he had done so much copious research that uh, I don't think there was any hole that had to be filled, if that makes sense. Uh Um, If anything, it's because also as an actor, I mean, if you talk to any actor, when you worked with, when you work with directors who are actors or have had some sort of acting training, those are the best directors to work with. Oh my gosh. Because they get it. It's, it's not just, Ooh, let's get the right shots, which who cares if something looks beautiful. If, if the story is not truly being told, I think it'll just be moving, a moving painting as opposed to truly telling a story. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah. But it, it takes integrating all of those elements. And, I, you know, I have to say that me personally, I'm not saying this just because he's my husband. We were concerned just because how is it working with your spouse? Do you know that right. whole element? Like, oh, boy. So what we did was we totally put aside, oh, that we're married. And I, I gave him the trust that I would, a director, he directed me and spoke with me like, okay, I, I need to get the best performance out of you possible. Um, he, we didn't bring in like, oh, did you forget to buy the toilet paper? You know, that wasn't on, on <laughs> set at all. <laughs> but uh, it was pretty amazing. Working with Oscar was literally one of the best and deepest experiences I've had as an actor. Because he knew the story so well. Uh, how it came to be that he directed the film was we were both. He, he was just going to at first help me produce and um, play possibly, you know, one of the roles, which he did in the film. Um, and we were going through people that we, we had known individually or together, um, interviewing some people, talking with people, networking and trying to find a director that we knew had the vision of this piece, really got the journey of the character. And it was so funny because even Oscar would say, yeah, no, she's not right. He's not right. You know, because we, that's one thing in terms of casting and also involving people below the line in terms of production. Um, We were just, let's get the best person for the job. So we had a very diverse and representative cast and crew. So we were looking for a great director and it occurred to me, I thought, you know, really, hearing Oscar talk, he really gets this. He gets Pretty Rosebud. I want him to direct it. But he'll probably say no, because he's never directed a feature film before. You know, he had done some short film projects. He'd also done some theater um, uh, projects as well, both in L.A. and Miami, that he directed. And so I knew he, he had no problem directing. It was just, you know, a feature film, film project. Maybe he didn't want to bite that off. Um, too much, I mean, more than he could chew. That's what, I, that's what I was thinking in my head. A couple weeks later, he said to me, you know, honey, I don't know how you feel about this, but I would really be honored if I could direct this film. Aww. And I, I literally burst into tears. I was like, that's what I was thinking, but I thought you didn't want to. You know what I mean? You're <laughs> in the same house. I didn't even have to ask. And Communication the- is key, the two of you. <laughs> and yes, exactly. Well, you mentioned the film earlier, and I was going to talk about it now. It's called Alex and Me. It's a film that's filled with Nickelodeon stars, and it debuted on Nickelodeon a few weeks ago. Uh, The film stars soccer player Alex Morgan in her acting debut. So could you tell that she had not been in a film before? You know, maybe, like, I think with anybody, when you first, actually, even with actors, when you first get onto onto a set, everyone has the slight trepidation of, like, who is the team that I'm playing with, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, so I think that's natural uh, from anybody, including myself. I was so impressed with her level of 
professionalism and care uh, and attention to detail to the point where, you know, she would do scenes uh, and shoot scenes. And in speaking with the director, she wanted to make sure to get everything right, to hit the right notes, to be in the right place. And then she would even see things in um, uh, on the set that might be out of sync. You know, it's like, oh, wait, this, this is not quite right. And, of course, she wow. would know because she's a world-famous soccer player. So uh, she really jumped in. You could tell that she cared about the project just as much as she did, you know, winning a soccer match. You know, what I, it, it was so, it was, it was very inspiring to see. And actually, um, I, could, I, I thought to myself, oh, yeah, see, this is why she is who she is. Because you know that saying, how you do one thing is how you do everything? Right. That she was a really a good example of that. And then on top of that, I do have to say, quick plug for Alex Morgan. I could not believe how down to earth and cool she was and warm. And, you know, because, like, of course, you know, you're the star of the movie. You're, you also are known all over the world. She would get stopped everywhere wow. like, <laughs> by people because they're like, oh, my gosh, you're so amazing. We love you. And it's because she's so talented. And then also her, her, her personality, um, you just feel like she's someone you could hang out with again, you know, and, and just uh, be best friends with. Really cool person. So um, we are reaching the age that we now pl- play the moms, as you yes. did in this movie. <laughs> I yes, um, I am no longer the teenage ingenue. No, nope. no, no, no. <laughs> We've moved past that now. Um, but this oh, yeah. was a family, uh, a fun family-oriented film. Do you see yourself doing more of these in the future? I do. In fact, um, before this, uh, and several years before this, I had done something also at Tasty Time with the Frog, and I, it was like a little cute cooking show. Um, Mark Hamill actually voiced the um, the Frog. It, it was part cartoon and part real life. So Mark Hamill did the voice in the cartoon portion, and in the you know real life version, I was playing a mom teaching my young daughter how to cook. And I have to tell you, I love these projects. Um, because, you know, it, it's so filled with heart and also fun, humorous. Like, yeah. There are projects, don't get me wrong, I love dramatic stuff as well. That's what I tend to write and gravitate to. But it's, uh, that can hurt your heart after a while. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, wow, this is really intense. Can I please watch a comedy? You know? Yeah. <laughs> I need to like life again. Oh, dear. Um, let me you know, remove myself. And when I'm involved in these these kinds of projects, like Alex and me, Tasty Time with the Fun, um, it's 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 light. I get to have fun. I get to collaborate on on what feels like a normal everyday level of existence. You know, the stakes are not, oh my gosh, you're going to die. It's, hey, you know, uh, how can I help you with your schoolwork? You know what I mean? Right. It's, it's yeah. Normal. And I and I love it because I I just get to be me. You know. So much fun. And and I have to tell you, the actors and actresses I get to work with, um, like on, on both of these projects, like the the actress, Sienna Agadong, who played my daughter, and Matt Cornell, who played my son, um, it, it's just so much fun to play with younger actors because there's definitely a sense of, of freedom, not being jaded, of creativity. Like, let's jump in the play box, you know, the sandbox, and, and see what we can build. It's, um, I love that. I love that feeling. There are a few things we've heard actors tell us through these interviews over and over. Many of them want to be in a Hallmark Christmas movie and others say, I want to be in a Lifetime movie. And you've, you were in a Lifetime movie. So tell us a little bit about your experience on the Lifetime movie, Nightclub Secrets. Um, I have to tell you, I had so much fun because it was my first time being able to play this kind of role. I got to play a, a sexy, ball-busting, boss lady kind of character. <laughs> you, and you were the nightclub I, manager, I was, right? I was, I was. I was the nightclub owner. Oh, right. And yes. So, uh, and, you know, this is a slight spoiler alert, slight, but because I know they're going to air it again on Lifetime, but I like being one of the good guys. That's all I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> all right. And... <laughs> but um, 
I, I really, I enjoyed working with the director. I had worked with him before. Actually, funny enough, that the director of uh, Nightclub Secrets was also the director of uh, Tasty Time with the Frank. Now oh. notice, those are two totally different types of projects, which just goes to show you, not just actors, but directors too. You know, we, if, if a project calls to us, if we want to work, if that's what we want to focus our energies on at that moment, you know, we'll change genres. We'll do something that is not typical. And I think that's what makes it interesting, too. You know, it's like, it's, it, again, it's like playing in a sandbox. Ooh, today I'm going to be a princess. Tomorrow I'm going to be a cop. You know, whatever. So, uh, but playing, uh, playing in nightclub figures, I play Percy, the nightclub owner. And um, interestingly enough, my husband was also cast in the film. And so we actually had... Uh, a, one or two, definitely one scene together, which was fun because that hasn't happened before, where we were cast in the same project and we worked together. Oh, fun. Yeah, very fun. So tell us what you have coming up. There's a couple of projects that we can see on IMDb. Tell me what, what you're yeah. working on. Okay, so there's one that isn't on IMDb yet. Um, I know that it's actually, it hasn't appeared there. Again, you know, that's the pipeline of IMDb, but uh, uh, we've already done deal memos and, and um, the ball's rolling. There's one called, a film called Ulysses Coyote, and it's, we're shooting that the beginning of next year. I'm very, very excited. Um, and it's, I would say, to, without, you know, giving too much of the, the plot away. Oh, I had actually, again, I had, mentioned how there are relationships like in all businesses. Yes. Well, I've worked with this director before I was actually a lead in another one of his films. So um, this uh, called Vertical. So the director of this one is um, Stephen Savage, and the name of the film to be shot is called Ulysses Coyote. Now, you know how we were talking about IMDb, when does it come out or whatever. It'll be interesting because I don't know if it'll, it'll say Ulysses Coyote 2019 um, because that's when they shoot it but it might who knows when it will come out it could out come out in 2020 it right. could come out you, you know right. it depends on the pipeline right you know what the turnaround will be um, and um, so yeah I'm, I'm very very excited to play that uh, I'll be playing one of the leads as uh, how shall I be uh, another tough chick. I'll just call it say that. <laughs> <All> <laughs> I don't, right. you know, don't want to give too much of the plot away or whatever, you know, because uh, it's his, his project. Um, uh, another tough chick in the desert, but it's, it's something that's different. That's what I love about playing different characters. Great. I get to inhabit a different storyline, a different character, someone who has a, an entirely different history than anyone I've ever played before. I'm a, I'm a single mom. It, it'll be a, a lot of fun. Um, now, the ones that you mentioned, Elizabeth, on IMDb, I am really sad to say. Uh, uh, pardon me if I get a little choked up. But um, uh, those two projects, one is a short film and one is a, a, a feature film, the writer and producer, um, he literally died this week. Oh, um, no. Good. We're sorry to yeah, hear that. Yeah, he, he he has, yeah, he, um, uh, Paul Vasquez, uh, uh, he wrote the project. Um, he was also an actor. He had been on Sons of Anarchy, and, and he wasn't very old. So, and, and so, you know, when things like that happen, it just feels like it's just unexpected. So um, I don't think those will go forward, to be perfectly honest. Um, okay. um, understandably so. But, yeah. you know, may he rest in peace. Cause, uh, yeah. Let's talk about social media. You're on it. Oh, yeah. We've stalked your Twitter. Uh, tell us wh where we <laughs> no, can find we you. We haven't stalked your Twitter. Oh. I don't even know how to get there. All right. I stalked your Twitter. <laughs> well, I got to learn well, everything about we're you. We're Facebook friends, so I can see what she's doing yeah. on Facebook, and that's the extent of what I'm allowed to know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I am on Facebook, you know, just shooty too, and then I also, and then just, I don't know if I need to do this, but... I'll, I'll do it. I'll spell my name, you know, for the listeners. It's Let's do it. C-H-U-T-I, and last name is T-I-U. Just because phonetically, 
and how it looks, it's not exactly the same. Correct. I, believe me, I've gotten every pronunciation <laughs> under the sun. <laughs> Chucky? Chucky? Oh, <laughs> you might have been... You might have been in the Spanish class when <laughs> Mrs. Papin said to me, um, to you, is Tio here? I'm like, actually, Tio, and that's my last name. So you can call me Chudy. Like, she, she didn't know which one was my, <laughs> oh, man. my first or last name. It oh, happened. my God. <laughs> and so. then, I'm, so I'm on Facebook. I'm uh, Chudy, too. I'm also on Instagram, Chudy, too, and Twitter, Chudy, too. To be honest, I am most active on Instagram. I need to get back onto Facebook a little bit more. And then um, Twitter, my gosh, Twitter, I forget about because it's, I feel like it's just not as user friendly for some reason, you know, like you're limited on your characters and then sometimes the images don't pop up, which is why I just love Instagram. Yes. So Instagram is, is my, is my jam, so to speak. All right, then. Awesome. I got nothing. Well, thank you very much for coming on, even though we had to, you know, reunite you with Elizabeth. I hope that was okay. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Oh, my gosh. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Nick. This was a lot of fun. Our thanks to Judy, too, for being on the show today and not being afraid that an old high school person would tell embarrassing stories. Yeah, I don't really have a lot of embarrassing stories. She really is just so incredibly talented Mm. that sometimes it was almost hard to be near her because she was just like radiate awesomeness. And you're like, I don't know what to do here. She did volunteer (laughs) to be in my next film. so She did. That was mighty nice of her. Going to probably hit her up with that if we ever get our movie (sighs) off the ground because that's going to make for some good podcasting stories if I actually get to make this movie but anyway well you know we've you know you want to direct it but we've we've uh we've had a lot of guests on the show that you know you could probably recall oh definitely yeah say come on down you got it all right so guys you can follow us on twitter and instagram at fan counters live you can also join our big facebook community by searching fan counters on facebook now this is really important we are doing our very best to grow the show to grow the audience and you can help by sharing our show with your friends and that would be very much appreciated uh get them to listen download it uh tell them to binge it because we've had some doozy as elizabeth likes to use that word of guests that they can enjoy so yeah uh, anyway, that's going to do it for us. You can email us in the meantime at hello at fancounters.com. Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you later. This was a podcast from the Pod Fix Network. You can check out more shows like it at podfixnetwork.com.